right ho. Um, I guess we may as well make a start since I'm making it two minutes past. Um, for, just in case you're wondering where you are, this is Pearl of the Green Mill House. Um, that's the Mill House. Uh, rather, that was the Mill House. It was stored for the sales of the windmill in about 1906. These days it's more like that. Um, which is where I live. Um, there are a number of interesting bits of books up in there to various lineups, boxes, and raspberry pies, and god knows what else. We all manner of interesting things, so this is a talk on what's going on. And, if you listen, I should also note that when I started writing that talk, that was a small G. Um, these days, it's a large G because, um, can't help it. I got so fed up with the rest of them. So, um, We'll begin with, let's have a quick uh, introduction to the folks who matter around here. There's me, um, who, um, yes, I had less grey hair then, don't ask. Um, one of the primary causes of it is uh, my lovely wife. Um, he's the customer for a lot of this stuff, which tends to result in, why must he do this? I haven't thought of that. And other sorts of noises, but we also have. James, who is the major cause of the grey hair, um, and also the major cause of the electricity bill. Uh, we also have a bunch of cats who aren't terribly important in the grand scheme of things, except that they do give rise to rule zero, <laughs> which is, trust me. <laughs> so, um, it all started back when Eon, who were our power company, were giving away these boosters. I don't know if anybody else got one of these. Um, they're quite fun, actually. Um, especially when you realise it's got a USB cable. And, which brings us to rule one. Rule one says it's got a USB port, a Bluetooth port, or Wi-Fi, or a serial port, or an app that talks to it, or Zigbee, or anything else, it's fair game. So, let's plug it in. Uh, what it comes with is a clamp sensor that goes around your outgoing mains, incoming outgoing mains feed. Um, and there is then a cable from the back end of the box that plugs into a USB port. So, we plug it into a USB port. Hmm. What have we got? Oh, this should be pretty easy then. It turns out it's a, serial, it's a USB to serial adapter, which means that we can simply talk on the FTT by USB or something. Um, and hopefully we'll get some data out of it. First off, though, I did a quick Google, and it turns out that this is in fact a rebranded one of those. Uh, which is extremely useful because current class directions are quite open with their APIs and their interface stuff. They do provide a, a, a PC based app that uploads to their own, like a lot of these people, that uploads to their own graphing server, but it's their own graphing server and you can't get data back out of it afterwards. So, um, and there is in fact a device coming current, current cost sitting in CPAP, um, which I chose not to use for reasons I'll cover later. Um, so, time to break out some of our handy Pearl toolkit. Uh, device serial port. Um, it basically is a wrap around STTY so you can talk to your uh, talk to the device properly. Um, so, fishing in the current documentation, we discover it's a 57.6 cable serial port, 8 data bits, no parity, non stop it. And you just write that back using 4 arrow write settings, at which point you can open the port. So let's open the board and see what we get. XML. Oh, you can't have it. Um, fundamentally, it just spews XML out of you. Um, let's make that a bit more readable. Ooh. <laughs> go for XML tidy. We'll look at you without it. Um, as you can see, um, the interesting things are there is a watts figure, which, understandably enough, is the current watts it's reading through the little clamp sensor, uh, and also tells you it's sensor zero. This actually turns out to be quite handy because it will actually take up to nine sensors of various types. Um, so, um, 
you also know it also monitors the temperature. T and PR field is, is temperature. It's actually the temperature of the um, the little adapter box, the display box, not the temperature of the sensor, which means that it's basically the case of the little server room I've got it bloody cold. Um, you also, also, for later reference, note that nice helpful timestamp format, which does actually include things like a day and a date and a year. You'll see why later. Uh, so what can we do with this? Well, obviously enough, we can display it. That's fairly easy, we can write, we can write that, plonk it on a web page. Um, I'm surprised how well I kept my wife happy for just knowing how much power the house was using. Um, you can also graph it. Um, now, you can do this in Perl, but there's quite a few nice little third-party utilities for doing that. And what we originally started using was Google Power Meter. Thank you so much, Google, for discontinuing this, because it was the nuts nuts. Um, basically, you fed it data every five or ten minutes, and it sat there and graphed it for you. It did things like compare your property against um, similar properties in terms of how much power you were using. It had other nice things like a... Um, a line which was the minimum power consumption, which allowed you to give, get a feel for what your house used when you turned everything else off. Again, of which more later. Um, but Google discontinued that because um, it wasn't working, they weren't getting enough commercial use out of it. Very few power. There was also the feature that if your power company gave you a smart meter, some power companies had signed up to feed data to Google Power Meter, which is great. Except not, not enough of them did it, so Google closed it down. So we're now on what's now Zolifly and was Cosm, or Cosm, and before that was Pichu or Pichube or however you pronounce it. Um, they seem to have gone through more changes of owners than um, several of the companies I used to work for. Um, but that turns out to be also be quite nice for graphing, of which I'll show you more later. But now, so we need to read from this device, and we'd like to do it on a sort of every time it presents data to it. So, uh, enough of toolkit. Any event. Any event is nice, it sits in an event loop and it will respond to external stimuli like file levels being ready to read, timer events, that kind of thing. So here we um, set up an any event handle handler um, to read the data file handle, which is the USB socket we were talking to earlier. Uh, and then we do a push read on that, which fires us, which gives us a read handler that will trip the callback, which will trigger when a line of data is ready to read at the socket, which is at, at, the, at the serial port, which is exactly what we want. And then our read callback looks like this. Um, effectively, you get past in the handle, you get past the line you've just read, so we then process the line and we re push. The, the read handler for the next line. And you can just leave it sitting there in a loop, reading lines, processing them. So, how are we going to process them? Remember, this is XML, which leads us rather swiftly to rule two. <laughs> Don't. Um, and swiftly from there to toolkit number three. Now, there are many. Um, as the same goes, there are many XML modules, this one is mine. Some are good, some are bad, some are dreadful, some are incredibly complicated, but then so some XML. Uh, if, for what we want, and given this is a very simple-minded piece of XML, XML simple will actually do the job. Um, it's worth keeping the tool purely for that, because a lot of XML generated by devices isn't really proper XML, it's just some convenient structural data. So in this case, so moving on to our, um, so yeah, we, we, we create XML simple object, uh, we pass it to XML, we call XML in on it, and it gives us a data structure. So here's our XML, let's do the transform. And you get a hashref, which looks very like the XML, and usefully has the what's value, the temperature value, in a nice, easy, Perl processable way. So we can now write that process sub to effectively read our data from the sensor um, and then total up the watts so far, the number of samples we've got, read the latest temperature. Now, um, one of the reasons we're doing this is that that thing is firing off sensor events about every 10 seconds and the likes of Pachu, Cosm, Zively, Google, 
um, power meter, etc., tend to object if you swap them with data points every 10 seconds. So um, what we do is we keep saving up, we save up total and a, and a um, number of samples, and every so often we will take an average and um, spit it at the tube. Um, but first, the other thing that's worth noting, if you sit and listen to that data stream long enough, on the hour, every hour, it starts viewing history, which is vaguely useful, because it, it means if you've, if you've lost connection to it or whatever, it's probably still got kept connection, and it will tell you what's been going on. However, remember what I said about really stupid XML? This is really stupid XML. For a start, that's a really helpful timestamp. There is no date, there is no date, there is no year. If I find that file in isolation, I have no idea what it refers to. This particular stanza, that says, that's the average usage five months ago. <laughs> so I didn't bother using it. Because <laughs> it was really a bit silly. Uh, someday I might actually write a module to parse that properly, because um, it's so horrid, um, but it is occasionally useful just to have some historical data. But as you can see, somebody, somebody, somebody really was just using XML as a way of applying loose structure to some data rather than anything sensible there. Um, oh, yes, backtracking. I forgot to say, read the comment about regex. The reason I didn't use device current cost, and I apologise to the authors in the room, is he was using regex to parse XML. There's a rewrite of the way. But anyway, moving back to any event, um, we can do clever stuff. Um, we can set a timer as part of an event, and that basically says after 300 seconds, trigger it, and then every 300 seconds after that, we trigger it, and we just write send update handler. And the send update handler takes a, builds a data array which consists of current temperature and the average, temp the average power usage over the last samples. Um, and obviously zero the counts at that point, and then upload it to somewhere. Um, somewhere in this case for us is currently the tube, aka Zively, aka Cosm, which they make their minds up. Um, and basically, what you do in Cosm, Zively, the tube, <laughs> is to find a feed, and a feed can have channels. Um, so in this case, we've got channel zero is the temperature, channel one is that clamp sensor that's sitting on the mains. Uh, and they give you a feed ID and an API ID, and it really is very, very simple indeed. This, the package is still called NetTube because it hasn't been updated in a while. Uh, you feed it a key and a feed ID, which is the feed that you just set up on the web interface. Um, you, and you basically set, create a feed object from the NetTube object and send it some data. It's as simple as that. Uh, except, of course, the one thing we have forgotten to do is start the event open. Otherwise, it's going to sit there and go, yes, and. So here we have, that's the easy way of starting the event loop. Um, and to now, a temperature graph, that was from yesterday. Um, it's from the corner of, corner of the playroom where the server is, and as you can see, we turned the central heating on about um, half past six, and it slightly got warmer. Um, and there are similar graphs of power. The other thing to note is that, I don't know if you noticed, but I was forcing an API URL on the, the call to NetProtube U, and that's because that bug hasn't been fixed yet. Uh, in that they're now on API v2, and it should be api.lightly.com, um, which will apparently give you lots more shiny, shiny features. Um, but that, again, is on my to-do list, this event patch for that. So here's an interesting question for you. Um, do you know how much power your house uses? More to the point, do you know how much power your house uses when, when you think you've turned everything off, bar the fridge, and the always on server, and the PC you've left on with its green saver running, and the washing machine, etc, etc, etc. It's quite scary, because once we started doing this, um, 2010 didn't have this monitoring. 2011, we'd started spotting things. That's average power consumption per day. That's six kilowatt hours a day at 12 pence a day. So just from knowing what was going on. Uh, I'll explain why the 2012 figure dropped in a minute, but to quote my wife, 
Thanks, dear. Uh, and just, just in case you, you still aren't quite convinced, um, what what is 24 watt hours a day, or 24 times 365 watt hours a year, which is 8.76 kilowatt hours a year. 12 pence kilowatt hour, which is a little under what it is now, gives us. That's quite a scary figure. You leave a machine with 300 watt power supply on, and you're spending 300 quid just leaving that machine on. Um, also, that's quite a handy figure if you need it. Um, also, works out. That's, those are accurate within about 5%. So, supposing you've got your 300 watt computer running at 300 pounds a year, except, of course, it's probably been running for yachts, so that power supply is not terribly efficient, and if you're sitting there with Big beefy graphics card, print screen saver, I haven't bothered turning it off. That could be 500 watts. And that's costing you 500 quid a year. Um, and I looked at our server, which, is, which was at that point chewing to about 200 watts, um, and realised that we'd probably do something about that. If you haven't come across 80 plus power supply campaign, uh, you can buy power supplies with considerably beefy efficiency ratings. Um, and my home server now has. Not actually one of these, but it's baby brother because it's quite a lightweight machine. Note, 450 watt gold, so 90 odd percent efficient. 70 quid. Um, so let's do the maths on that. Scary. So. Um, there were several, several other things we did like that. I got rid of one rat mount server that was running always on and chewing about 250 watts and the wife was very happy. Uh, we rebuilt the mail server so it ran on a mini LTX board um, at 1.6 gigaton and that saved us another 100 quid a year. So well, amazing what you can do if you try. Uh, and then, we used to talk to other TV. Ah, fun, fun, fun. Now, uh, I'm guessing you're sort of mostly familiar with how this works. You have socking grade panels on the roof, you have an inverter which turns the DC from the panels into 240 volts AC. Uh, that usually goes through a meter, so you can see what the panels are generating. Fits into your fuse box, um, and then hooks up back to the rest of the grid. And if you start generating more than you use, then the power starts running this way, back to the, back to the electricity company. Which is very nice, and pleases the life. So they pay us for it. Um, now there are three points you can meet to this. We're already doing this one because that's where the clamp sensor is. Um, the problem with that um, is that it has no concept of direction. It does not know whether the um, yeah exactly. It does not know whether the hundred watts that you're, that you're feeding is going into the house or out of the house. Fortunately, um, this is one of the shiny modern new meters with a flashing light. Um, I, will, I will explain what we do with that in a bit. As is this one. It's the answer photo sensor, isn't it? It's a flashing LED. <laughs> <laughs> um, the nice people from current cost make one of these. You basically say photo sensor that you plonk over the LED. Yeah, 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 it's the <laughs> Don't knock it! It works! <laughs> so, essentially, so we installed one. Unfortunately, we'd have liked to put one on the solar on the solar generation as well, but current costs are sold out. And we're not getting any more until sometime early next year. But what we do get from this is that we've got sensor one, which is the, if sensor one is positive, i.e. the light's actually flashing, we're drawing power from the grid, and we can ignore the clamp sensor. If sensor one is at zero, then we can probably reasonably assume that sensor one is actually feeding sensor zero is reading power back to the grid and it's negative. So there we go. What about PV though? We could use another OptiSmart, except the current cost of sold out of them. Wait, what's this? <laughs> Rule one comes back. It's got a Bluetooth port. So let's have a nose around. Um, this is handy Linux tool for peeking around on the uh, Bluetooth bus. Yep. Hmm. Actually, it turns out there is a reason for that. Um, the server is down by my left foot as I just started this video. That wall 
is mud wall that you just walk towards is two feet thick with a full rubble infill. Uh, most of this house dates from the 1860s. Um, do you want you to have a drink? Uh, we are heading for the inverter, honest. This wall is all the internal walls solid stone. Um, the builders are in to fix the shower. The cats are surprisingly absent. I should have pre-cached this video, it's running at slightly slow frame rate. Um, also, this is not a drone flight in your house right now. This is <laughs> Sadly, no, this is me. Oh, <laughs> Wouldn't much as I would have liked it to have been a drone. I, I haven't got around to playing with drones yet. Uh, this wall you're facing is also solid stone, and it's actually facing back towards the server room. And the inverter <laughs> is up there. <sighs> However, this is where I actually get to be slightly smart because when we moved in, We fitted some structure cable. Uh, and in fact, right where I was standing when I, when I took that shot, there are a pair of Cat 5 sockets. Uh, it brings us to useful toy number one. So there's a connection from the patch panel to the server with one of those. The other end of it plugs in to the um, plugs into the wall socket, and there's a cable that runs up. So, take two. Uh, with that in mind, um, having sent the teenager, sorry, I mean remote hand service, upstairs with a piece of Cat5 and a USB cable extender and a Bluetooth dongle at the end, and told him to go hang it from the curtain somewhere near the loft hatch, we'll have another go. <coughs> ah, that's changed his mobile phone. <laughs> However, that is an SMA inverter. Bingo. Um, let's uh, have a peek, shall we? Um, SDP tool allows us to poke at that device and see what's hanging around on it. Uh, what we usefully find is a Bluetooth supported RF com serial port. <coughs> when a plan comes together. Actually, the is actually not so nice in the end, but we'll get to that in a moment. So, fishing things out of our toolbox. Now, Bluetooth. Um, now this little piece of code here effectively does what I just did there with the HCI tool info and the STP tool. The get remote devices, lists all the devices you can see, um, returns a hash um, where each key is the, each value is the name of the device, so we look for devices that start SMA because they're the inverter, and then we do an SDP search um, on that, and SDP or RF call um, is the um, is the word, brain, um, is the port. Um, so backtracking a little, you will notice, just as a gotcha, the serial port, like the ID for the serial port in, all, in, in the service classes is, is hex 1101. When you come to actually call net Bluetooth, for reasons best known to the authors of net Bluetooth, that has to be a string, not a hex string, not a hex constant. Just, just a little gotcha. So once we've done that, um, we can call that Bluetooth new socket RFCOM and then connect to it using the port that we've got from previously. Um, BTO, Pearl FH, will give us a file handle and we can talk to it. And it's all that simple. Another little gotcha here, connect returns zero on success. So don't do the usual that I did when I first wrote this code and do connect or because you're not getting file handle back. Um, okay, so the protocol for talking to this thing has been the subject of God knows how many people's research because SMA keep their cards very, very close to their test chips. And if I tell you that the first piece of code, the first thing that appears in everybody's implementation of the protocol is this table of checksums, <laughs> it goes downhill from there. I'm not about to explain how it all works. In fact, consider this a Greek demo as I don't quite have the pull version working yet, I'm using the C version at the moment. But um, this, this actually covers one thing that you will find yourself doing quite a lot when you're fanning around with other people's protocols, which is that um, you're going to want to manipulate bytes in Perl. 
Um, and a few handy subroutines if you haven't come across them. Pack basically takes a format string and some values. So C says a one byte unsigned character, and it will basically turn the, the integer 127 into an unsigned, <coughs> into one byte with an unsigned character, which is also exactly what CHR 127 does, and actually also what backslash x7f does. Um, but you can get clever on that because obviously, for example, if you need two ints followed by two chars followed by three unsigned shorts, you can do that and you will get the, the resulting hex string there. And conversely, you can also call on pack, which is quite useful when SMA sends you back incredibly weird shit in byte bounded format stuff. You can pull out the relevant bytes and do the right things with them. The other useful tool you will find at this point is VEC. VEC's quite sweet. Basically, VEC says, here's a string of bytes, and that says, pull me out the second one bit quantity. So in that case, um, it would pull out the one of X7, but the second bit is a one there, and pull out a one. Uh, but the useful thing is you can also give it a different width of chunk. So I can, for example, say, VEC dollar bytes four, eight, and that will pull me out the fourth byte from dollar bytes. Uh, the other nice trick is that VEC is also an L value, which means I can assign to it, which is great for building up, building up packets for, um, for sending to sending places. But anyway, much coding later, um, and believe me, this is all horrible stuff. It's got two levels of protocol, it's got handshake, it's got god knows what. But at the end of it, we can, honest, read from the inverter. <laughs> hand wave, hand wave, trust me. <laughs> um, and we can, at this point we're now back to where we were, in that we can now actually measure the total house power consumption, because total house power consumption minus the amount the inverter generates, minus what we send, minus what the counter on the grid is reading, gives us the amount we fed to or from the grid. Um, I point the wife is happy again, we have more graphs, she's going, what did we do yesterday? Kind of thing. I still haven't quite understood, despite the fact that she has all this lovely information, every morning she comes down, looks at the little Bluetooth gadget, writes the value on a piece of paper. <laughs> I love my wife. <sighs> and then, just for fun, we have solar water heating. Um, it's not really an AMP then, in that we actually got this back in about 2003. Um, effectively, what it does is um, there's a bunch of panels with heat exchangers in them, um, and there's a temperature sensor there, there's a temperature sensor top of the hot tank, there's a temperature sensor at the bottom of the hot tank. Uh, if the hot tank temperature at the bottom is cold with the panels, then it starts shunting, shunting off of the panels and heating the hot water. Which is brilliant because um, fundamentally we don't pay for hot water between about March and November. Which is really rather nice. It also comes with a handy monitoring tool. <coughs> Um, it also doesn't have any monitoring tool, except it doesn't talk to anything else, um, which is really annoying. Um, we've got rule one failure here, basically. Um, uh, but it, what it is, is uh, effectively you've got a little button there which allows you to cycle through the readings from the three temperature sensors. It's great for discovering whether there's enough hot water in the tank to have a shower. And the other thing is, it's a really good cure for. You know how, if, if you've not got instant on hot water, you'll be used to the, it's not hot enough for a bath, hit the button, wait for an hour. Except, it only actually takes about 10 minutes to get a hot tank of 35 to 45 for a shower. And you're wasting energy for the other for 50 minutes. So, um, it would be really nice, well, it, 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 it's nice in the, if you want to prepare to leg it upstairs before you, push the, before you go and push the button for hot water, you can actually tell you don't actually have to turn the hot water on for an hour just to get a shower. But um, we're lazy and we don't want to walk upstairs to see if we have enough hot water. Um, so, yeah, even if we do have a teenager to send up to do it for us. <laughs> so, um, useful toy number two. I mean, at this point, I was quite keen on being able to read both the top of the roof, temperature on the roof and the temperatures on the tank. So, for the temperature on the roof, the following toy. It looks distinctly painful. <laughs> um, it's a Vernier Go Temp. 
Um, basically, it's a multi grip temperature sensor in a reasonably weatherproof output of coating attached to a USB cable. Um, well, we had to, didn't we? So the crew went up on the roof. Um, that's, the, that's where the temperature sensor for the water heating system already goes, so we just shoved another sensor in there. Um, James is wielding large quantities of gaffer tape. Um, and then a useful toy 1B, which is basically a variant of the USB open cap 5, is a 10 meter powered USB extension <coughs> and a lot of small gaffer tape. Um, and that in fact comes in through uh, into the workshop roof they were standing on there, and we just need something to plug it into. That's useful. After all of that, let's plug it into that then. Um, useful tip. Yeah, another one. It's Pi tip number one. Raspberry Pi's have the USB ports up front. They are hopelessly, hopelessly underpowered. Um, I have not, I have tested in the living room, plugged in the Wi-Fi dongle, plugged in the USB temperature sensor and the keyboard, fired up the GUI to set up the um, set up the Wi-Fi, and the Wi-Fi dongle went, yeah, I'm here. Oh no. Power off. Yes I am. No, I'm not. Yes I am. So, pro tip, um, powered USB hubs. Especially the nice Amazon ones, which come with those two, which are 1.4 amp power outlets, and you can actually power a pie from that, pie the power a pie from one of that, and then loop back into the back of the hull. Um, right, so um, we have an ugly hack to talk to this, because it turns out that it basically talks to the USB device um, thing at the kernel, and you can simply open dev tell the USB 0, um, read 8 bytes from it, and it turns out again using unpack, but um, they are a count, a sequence number, and three temperature values in hundreds of a degree centigrade, as shorts. Brilliant. It's 28 to 4 uh, I don't know who ran that test, I think that must have been living somewhere I'm not. <laughs> That's all very well, but it's a bit ugly. And, and it turns out, in fact, that um, Vernia do actually provide a C++ library, C++ library, talk to it, and then some very nice person wrote um, a Perl library, which is basically an XS hack on top. Um, so, right, let's go build them on the Pi. Um, be aware that the Raspberry Pi is a 700 megahertz ARM chip. It's going to take a while to have the kettle on. It really is going to take a while. And that, in the end, gives us a much, much nicer code to talk to it. Um, fundamentally, uh, Instantiate a GoTem object, start it, give it time to wake up, three the measurement, and that gives you back the same array of three measurements and arbitrarily we take the last one. Um, so that goes to the roof. Now, uh, I think that GoTem Go 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 sensor is about that long, it's a bit big for attaching to a water tank. Um, so, and besides, I've got the Raspberry Pi kicking around. So, um, it's all wire temperature sensor. They're quite sweet, actually. Um, they plug into, you can plug it into the GPI port, GPIO ports in the Raspberry Pi. Um, they're dirt cheap. They're, I mean, that, that um, GoTemp was about 50 quid. Those are five for five from Hong Kong. And you need, the only thing you need is a bunch of 4K7 port resistors. Uh, you can connect them in parallel. The way the one wire protocol works, um, you send a message out down the wires to the sensor and you can find, with, with, a, with an address for the sensor on one sensor will respond and the others won't. So you power the ball on pin 4, on GPO pin 4, 3.3 three, three, three volts around, hook up the pilot resistor. Does require some soldering or alternatively get yourself a Pi breadboard. Um, and that's pretty much that. It turns out that there is a Perl library for talking to them. Um, in the HiPi or Hippie, however you can pronounce it, Perl library, you can go fetch that. And they run Perl Hippie install, and guess what? And once again, it's beautifully simple. You instantiate, uh, you, you get um, a Hippie interface PS18X20 to list all the um, temperature centers out there. Since I know I've only got one, I take the first one. I instantiate a copy of the interface. Uh, I started a copy of uh, the interface BFX20 and I read the temperature. Simple as that. Um, so we've now got, um, oh, no, I don't know, you've got me. Um, 
So we can now fairly easily fit two of those top and bottom of the tank. Um, ah, but we have a problem in that all the data is on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so, um, let's, let's at least get a little clever here. Um, <coughs> IoT sensor DS18X20, which is a wrapper around the, the um, Raspberry Pi Plus. Um, it has a, a one wire object, which is the Raspberry Pi Plus. It has an ID, and it's a flag, which does the UCD. And then we simply have an init function that does pretty much what we did before. Um, and then set self arrow oriented um, just so we know we've done it. Um, and equally, we have a value method which does what we expect. So we have basically wrapped it in that we can call dollar sensor arrow init and then dollar sensor arrow value and it'll give us back a temperature value. Um, we can then do exactly the same for our go temp sensor. Um, and then we can turn ourselves into job for it as briefly. <laughs> Um, this is this is one of my little classes, Lucent's Abstract Factory. It basically builds a factory class, um, so you don't have to care what's hiding underneath. Um, you tell it, um, implement a favorite class of bio, which says, I pass, if I pass you in the string GoTem, then the class that implements this is IoT Sensor GoTem. Um, if you're being really rigorous, you can also define a role that tells you what methods your backend classes have to implement, um, which are very Java and Squid. Um, and having done that, um, we can run up a copy of Dancer. Which is all good fun. Um, so Dancer, um, you say, sensors, top tank sensor is a DSATB20, so it's a typo. It has a one more idea of some sort. And in fact, the underlying class actually allows it to pass in a correction and a multiplier just in case our temperature thinks it's not reading right. Now we can do the same for the roof sensor, which is a type go temp. And it's probably got it's some idea in the Vernier subspace as well. Um, and, that's, and then we tell Dancer to use JSON serializer. And then it actually oops, almost, not quite, but almost falls out of the wash. So, in our dancer handler, we call him IoT Sensor Factory, ignore the, the stereo technology should go in here, but um, the intent is that we talk to slash sensor slash roof, for example. So we go, my little sensor is sensor factory create, which is the abstract factory create method. We pass in the sensor type from the config file, and we pass in the ID and any extra args. Uh, and what comes back is the appropriate IoT sensor class corresponding to the sensor, uh, which we don't have to care what it is, because all we then do is we build up a hash which contains sensor error value, a current time step, sensor ID, a type of sensor, and then Dancer's, Dancer's lovely magic serialization will turn that into JSON for us. And we just call that, and that will give us. And obviously from there on you write yourself a nice pretty little web page with a picture of water tank and stuff and JSON that populates the populates the text field. <coughs> uh, for extra wide happiness factor. And more to the point, that allows you to go, go fancy bath, yeah, water's not to temperature. <laughs> Which is part of the name of the game. Um, that is pretty much it. Um, I do have one more type of sensor, um, which is this interesting little beast here. Let me come across fidgets. Right, fidgets are really cool. They're a little bit pricey compared to things like all white sensor, but effectively there are a whole bunch of little USB boards that do just about anything you might ever want involving sensing, robotics, etc. Et so this is a fidgets. Um, Temperature sensor, I'll explain this in a minute. <laughs> this is a fidget temperature sensor board. Uh, that's a thermal couple. Um, basically, it plugs into the little screw terminals, and that will take full temperature sensors. They also do motion, pressure, position, strain, pH, humidity. You see where we're going here? <laughs> and so on and so forth. Uh, they do stepper motors, they do relay boards in ones, in fours, in eights. 
they do digital switches, they do analog sliders, you name it, there's a little board that will interface to it or to one of their, they've got a, a thing called the interface board which takes eight analog inputs, eight digital inputs, and has eight digital switching outputs which most of the sensors connect to. Things like temperature sensors are an exception. But fundamentally, there's all manner of really cool shit. <laughs> uh, my friend Chris, my friend and colleague Chris, is starting a microbrewery. Um, you remember Chris, Chris Jones, if nobody else does. Um, and he is um, looking for a few bits of automated automation, including finding out what temperature mash comes at, uh, being able to turn on the cooling jacket for the fermentation tank when it's too hot, etc. 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 So, next year's talk is going to involve automating Papworth Brewery, and Chris has promised that if we get it all working, you will get free beer. Hooray. Get to work. Sorry? <laughs> get to work to get it. <laughs> oh, I have a vested interest in I'm on the tasting panel. <laughs> um, I'm also with one of these marketing advice. <laughs> so, um, that's pretty much the Green Mill House as it stands. There is more yet to come. Um, I want to get the fidgets working here, at home, before I get them working in Chrissy's Brewery, uh, since I'd rather not waste Chrissy's time. Um, I need to do a bit of soldering to get all of the what wire sensors actually up and working <coughs> rather than bread will be. Um, and I would, and I have to finish off the inverter code. I said it's currently running on, on a C version of the library, which is an even more awful hack. Um, and it really does need a proper module sticking in CPAN, the uh, device SMA inverter or something that will allow you to talk to arbitrary SMA inverters. Um, and so, Yes, that is Callisto trying to help us put the sensor in the um, hot water tank. Yes, it's a cat climbing a ladder, head first down. <laughs> Ascending or descending? Uh, descending, okay. at that point. She had spent um, about five minutes chasing cables and refused to be photographed doing so, <laughs> despite our best efforts. Um, and she was being very, very helpful. There's an awful lot of gaffer tape on my roof because the cats all go up there, even without a ladder. So, there you go. It's amazing that you can do a bit of a, a polite, a polite fiddle.
I don't know that's why I probably wouldn't have time to mention when we find the slide. Uh, one of the other things current costs do is you know you can get those little plug-in individual device monitors that will tell you how much. Um, they do one of those which talks back to the um, talks back to the, the mothership, and thus you can graph. Um, I've never seen the graph of washing machine in action before now. Um, so one of the sneaky tricks we pull is when it's sunny, we put the washing machine on a timer so it doesn't come on until, until the solar panels kick in. You did a laundry for free. The other thing we learned from this is Bosch Lye. Um, if you look at um, the eco, eco setting on their washing machines, actually uses more power than the non eco setting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure whether it uses more water, because we haven't got a way of testing that yet. <laughs> um, but having actually run the having, having run the graphing of the, I've got the graphs on my blog. Um, I'll, if, if this talk goes up, I'll make sure the links go up. It transpires that the, the water heating peak is slightly shallower but considerably wider to the E cup, uh, and it actually uses more power. So if you are on a sunny day where you can compensate for that, the fact that solar panels are kicking out to enough kilowatts, um, we won't get screwed by the eco city. Uh, for my next trip, we'll do the same thing on the top of the road. <laughs> Twelve volt systems in your house? Or when <laughs> no. I've, my house, I've, I've rewired volt. the house for Cat 5, that's about the limit, given that it involves drilling through an awful lot of foot thick stone walls. So I did, yeah, mine too. I did uh, 12 volt circuit too, which is a because you've got this the hideous inefficiency of an inverter, yeah. followed by the hideous inefficiency of a transformer to put oh, back yeah, up And also on your water point, I had a bad oil leak. My, my central heating was oil fired because I lived in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and the, the steel oil tank burst to the bottom and rotted out of the air side. It was away in the state. I came back and a thousand litres of oil, litres of oil had dumped into the ground beneath it. So I got to thinking, now you can buy these little tiny inline turbines. So I have an inline turbine at the tank end inline turbine and boiler end. I also have this in all of my uh, water outlets in the house. Then I have a little comparator circuit which says, is the water coming into the house? To compensate that for the water that's going out. Water that's coming out of the taps. If there's ever a disparity, I have an electric valve on which shuts the water off. Cute. In that case, the, the oil on. That, uh, at this point, I'm starting to get inventive and wondering if fidgets do a flow meter. <laughs> uh, I'm told the current costs are in the process of releasing something which will allow you to try gas consumption, which I suspect is going by my next customer request. You know, by the way. Gas pressure sensor. Sorry? Fidgets have a gas pressure mm. sensor. There's all manner of fun stuff. So, yeah. I've got pressure. You can do flow. Yeah, like a construction. So, anyway, as you can tell, I've been having fun. <laughs> anyway, yes? Yes? So, the point that we just recently brought you just on the like the eco setting is kind of a standard. So, it's not surprising that some of your settings are better than eco, because eco is a standard of cost machines machine to fight Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but still, we uh, Bosch, Bosch were not very forthcoming when challenged about that one. No. <laughs> it was a shame, really. Okay. I think we're done then.